When we last left our story, Omar had just discovered Deuteronomy 18.18 and thought perhaps his prayers had been answered, that he had found the Bible verse that would prove Muhammad was a true prophet. Fast forward a couple years. Omar has listened to Muslim apologists and read Muslim websites. Zakir Knight couldn't be wrong. He has three million subscribers, he tells himself. But deep down, he just isn't sure. He's not prepared to put his belief to the test and listen to counterarguments. Sometimes, however, life has a way of exposing our lies, whether we like it or not. Little Deuteronomy 1818 starts swimming out into the ocean, into the land of the Kafir. Get back here, Omar shouts, but the little verse isn't listening. Don't go wandering through the Bible. You never know what you're going to find. Still, no response. The penalty for apostasy is death. Finally, little Deuteronomy is convinced and starts to swim back. But oh no, what is this? A Christian apologist has appeared. He makes quick work of Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, showing that it couldn't be about Muhammad, since he's not related to Moses and never saw God face to face. What's worse, the passage itself condemns Muhammad as a false prophet. Omar tries to give a defense, but the apologist's friend blinds him with facts. Stunned for a moment, he doesn't know what to do. When he comes to his senses, the apologists have left, and Deuteronomy 18.18 18 seems to be gone. But Omar is not ready to give up. He gives chase, hoping to save his precious verse. The boat is too fast, and he eventually loses sight. Where am I? he asks. He hasn't gone that far. Just fifteen chapters. Perhaps our hero will be able to find Muhammad in Deuteronomy 33. We jumped into the De to Deuteronomy 18.18 18 last week, and we discovered that there is no possible way that it could have been Muhammad. Um, to bring us all up to speed, I know we need reminders. We are creatures of, of repetition. We uh, gave the introduction talking about the importance of finding Muhammad in the Bible because of uh, Surah 7, Ayah 157, which says that you can find the unlettered prophet uh, written about in the scriptures that the Jews and Christians have in between their hands. So you'll be able to find the descriptions of Muhammad. So uh, the Quran and Islam itself is actually built on the foundation of previous scriptures, as so much as it says in uh, chapter 7, verse 157. The issue with this becomes when we start to look for Muhammad, because he must be there, the Muslim actually ends up running into a dilemma. So if they find Muhammad written about in description and name and all the things that these Muslim apologists are claiming, then it actually affirms the Bible as being God's divinely inspired word. If we compare God's divinely inspired word from the Old Testament and the New Testament to the Quran, we find that they stand in absolute stark contradiction to one another. So even if we do find Muhammad written about in our scriptures, it actually disproves Islam and disproves the Quran as possibly being the eternal words from an un uh, or from an all knowing God. Or if we don't find Muhammad written in our scriptures, it disproves that Muhammad is a prophet because he was not written about in our scriptures. We understand the fallback arguments that Muslims are going to say. They're going to say there's total. Uh, corruption, some degree of corruption within our scriptures, but this is impossible because in uh, Quran chapter 6, 114, it says that <clears throat> no man can change Allah's words, and over 15 times throughout the Quran, it identifies the previous scriptures, namely the Torah, the Zabur, which is the 
Psalms and the Injil, which are the Gospels, as being God's divinely inspired words. And if no man can change those words, it leads them into another dilemma, because if they say it's been corrupted, they are actually denying what their Quran tells them, and they thus become apostates. And then if they believe that our scriptures have not been corrupted, it disproves their own scriptures. So we call this the Islamic dilemma, which they find themselves in. But Thaddeus and I, we're generous folks. We're going to search for him as much as we possibly can in this wonderful and amazing epic journey called Finding Nomo. So that's bringing us up to speed a little bit. Thaddeus, if you want to add anything, please go ahead. Or if anybody in the audience wants to, we'll be more than happy to entertain your comments. Titled this one, Muhammad Shown Forth. Uh, and the reason why we're bringing this up, I've heard it a couple of times from Muslim, like contemporary Muslim apologists. Uh, but when we read the passages from the famous 20th century uh, Muslim commenter, he said this was one of the passages that you can actually find Muhammad in. And as I typically do, we go straight into the spoiler alert. But, uh, you know, we're going to we're going to jump right into it. So. Thaddeus, these are words that Muslims, they love. They love these particular words. They love, uh, number one, I, I wrote down 10 words that they love. They love the word one. They love the word Arabia. They love the word camel, especially in our Bible. They love the word, how do you pronounce that, Thaddeus? Yeah, Puba works for me. Okay, Puba. Uh, they love the word paraclete. They love when the Bible says Kadar, and they love it when it says Paran. They love it when the Bible, uh, and this, especially in the Hebrew, the word ends in I am, im, Muhammadim, right? So it's very important. They love those words. It's really, really cool. They love the word Ishmael, and they love the word servant anytime they go to our scriptures. However, there is a flip side, and on the opposite of love is hate, and Muslims hate certain words. They hate the word three, and, and so much so that they say the word three, and then they say detest from saying the word three, but you have to do things in threes all the time in Islam, but we don't, we don't worry about consistency. They yeah, well, I, he I heard that in uh, Muslim education, when they learn to count in kindergarten, they go <laughs> one, two, four, five, Six. <laughs> they should say four twice or two twice. I feel like they're going to be yeah, missing well, one, two, two and a half, four, <laughs> five, two, two point oh, four. Um, <laughs> right. So they hate three. They hate the word Israel. They hate the phrase tame sheep. I don't know why Thaddeus. They hate the word pagan. They hate the word shirk. They hate the word context. They hate the word facts. They hate the word crucifixion. They hate the word context and they hate the word facts. So there are 10 things that the Muslims detest. So we're going to jump right into the verses that we're going to go into, but I'm going to read it as if I were a Muslim. Right, so this is this is how the Muslims are forced to read this passage. This is Deuteronomy 33, verse 1 through 4. Now this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the Israelites before his death. In addition to this, giving them hope of an Arab prophet to come and pronounce curses upon them. Then he said, Yahweh, I mean, Muhammad came forth no wait came will come from sinai and he dawned i mean he will dawn upon them from seer wait a second we saw we see a word here in red seer that's really important for them he uh shone forth wait he will shine forth from mount paran and he came with mirrors he was sorry he will come with myriads of holy ones at his right hand a fiery law for them. Moreover, he loves his people. Uh, the and never mind. We'll go. We'll go into this deeper. All the holy ones uh, will be in your hand, and they 
bowed down. Wait, they will bow down. Sorry, the holy ones were in your hand, but it should be will be in your hand. And they bowed down or will bow down to your feet. Each one accepted directions from... No, this is hard to read, Thaddeus. Each one will accept directions from you. A law from Moses Muhammad uh, instructed... I mean, will instruct for us a possession of the, se the assembly of Jacob, or uh, actually it's the assembly of Muslims. That was tough to read. I'm sure it was tough to hear. Um, but I'm reading this for all of us so that we can see how the Muslim mind is going to be reading into this passage if they go to it to say, look, this is a passage about Muhammad. Uh, it, I just want to let you know, it would have been a lot easier if you had just gotten the Zakir Naik translation of the Bible. Oh, it's about yeah. three pages long in total, and it makes all those corrections for you in advance. Oh, it does? Okay. Yeah, next time I, I do a slideshow, I'll just go to the Zachar Knight collection, and that'll save us a lot of headache. <laughs> uh, but what does the text actually say, Thaddeus? It says this, Now this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the Israelites before his death. Then he said, Yahweh came from Sinai, and he dawned upon them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came with myriads of holy ones. At his right hand, a fiery law for them. Moreover, he loves his people. All the holy ones were in your hand, and they bowed down to your feet. Each one accepted directions from you. A law Moses instructed for us as a possession for the assembly of of Jacob. So we see the stark contrast between the two ways of reading it. We see that they're using a future tense words, and then this other one, the actual biblical passage, has past tense words. We're going to uncover a little bit more about that here in just one second. So okay. as you see on your screen, we read something very important here, Thaddeus. What do you think that is? I know I'm giving you a hint on the screen, but what what is the most important thing that we read from that passage that that makes us just forget everything else and go straight into a celebration? Well, I mean, you did highlight three words. So mm -hmm. without this visual clue here, I might not know which was the most important. But but you're highlighting uh, Paran here. Mm -hmm. and, and whenever a Muslim sees that term in the Bible, they know that the passage must be about Muhammad because he's the only person that's ever been to a place with that name in the entire history of the world. Yeah. And we're going to get an idea of what Muslims actually think Paran is is and where it is and we're also going to um you know kind of figure out how it, it's really strange thaddeus uh, especially here in america um, there are towns named after towns that are in england um so that can get confusing i know but uh, anyhow we're gonna we'll we'll skip past that for now right so when muslims do see the word paran uh, the champagne, camel champagne bottles start flowing because when it comes to the Bible, that means that Muhammad is nearby. Honestly, they get so excited that they do not give a shirk if it is shirk because Muhammad is their homie. And sure, margarine tastes like butter, but that's why one brand named their product, I can't believe it's not butter. But margarine isn't actually margarine any more than uh, the truth is uh, butter for shirk. So we would have to call this particular product uh, here, uh, especially, and you'll see why it is. Most of you guys probably have saw it. I want to name this, I can't believe it's not shirk. It's a lot like I can't believe it's not butter, except for the, sh the I can't believe it's not shirk is actually just, it's just shirk. But Honey Badger don't care. Honey Badger don't give a shirk. It just takes what it wants and it and it does whatever it wants with the passage. And what what does what does it want? Why why do they think that they have found this in their scripture, Thaddeus? Why do you think that is? Um, I, I guess it's because they they need to find some sort of clear reference to Muhammad, mm -hmm. and they can't really find any clear reference. So then they go to anything 
that has any possible connection to the geographical region of Arabia. And then if they can find any other word in that passage that kind of sort of sounds like Muhammad, like in this mm-hmm. case, law. Oh my gosh, it says law and it says Quran. <laughs> this must be about Muhammad. Yep. Uh, yep. It doesn't matter what the words of the text are. You, you just mm-hmm. find those keywords and then you change all the rest of the words, how much ever you need to. Well, I'm going to I'm going to build their case for them a little bit here because uh, we read a translation that said myramids, which can also indicate 10,000 of something. It could indicate mm-hmm. 10,000 of something. And uh, apparently uh, Muhammad overtook uh, Mecca, right, with 10,000 jihadis. Uh, and the angels and all kinds of things were were with him, right? So we have kind of triangulated somehow uh, three different things that could possibly point to Muhammad as being uh, this this prophet here that is being prophesied, if this is indeed a prophecy. Um, but you know what? That's what happened. He came with the law. He, he came from Paran, and he used myriads of holy ones to march on Mecca. Now, this is totally believable unless we do this annoying thing called properly exegeting the passage using context, which Muslims hate that word, and facts. So we're going to actually do it, right? So Muhammad is in there if you don't think about it. Now, we're going to go into a little section here that I like to call Kafir's do geography. So there's a couple of key phrases that we spoke about. One of them was uh, Yahweh dawned forth from Sinai. Okay, so you can see the Sinai Peninsula there on your screen. He shone forth from Seir. So you can see the general area of where Seir is. And um, he came from Paran. So there's two different areas in which the Bible identifies Paran. It could be in the highlighted spot you see there on your screen, or you also see up north, really close to Israel, present-day Israel, the wilderness of Paran. So the Muslims believe that this is a passage referring to Paran and Sila and Seir and all of these ge- geographical locations that they believe are within their particular theological geography space. But here's the issue, Thaddeus. The issue is I, on, on the left side of your screen, you see highlighted Jeddah and then a little bit uh, south and east of that is where Mecca is highlighted. Up north, you see the general location of actual Paran. I don't know how good you are at reading, Thaddeus, but how many kilometers away is that? Uh, I don't see. Oh, uh, 1,128. Okay, so using Google Maps, I drew this out. It is at least 1,000 or basically 1,100 kilometers south of any of the known locations that Moses marched or, or went around, right? So this is talking about the Israelites during their exodus. It's referring back to key points and key moments that they were um, experiencing, that they had already experienced. So the Muslim understanding of this is that Moses and the Israelites, they went through the wilderness in between. You can see Egypt over there on the left and Israel over there on the uh, on the right, just a little bit further north between Egypt and Lebanon. They think somehow they just took some random detour for no particular reason all the way down to a place of an undisclosed, unlocated, un. There's exactly zero archaeological evidence that this place even existed before the 7th century AD, but they don't care. They don't give a shirk if it is shirk. So they believe that Sinai and Seir, right? Sinai represents Moses. Seir represents Jesus and Paran represents Muhammad. We're going to play another game, Thaddeus. This game is called Which One of These is Different from the others. <laughs> well, you know, two of those are fairly close geographically. The other's pretty far away. Okay. Um, however, the esteemed 
scholar of all things, <laughs> Safras Hussein has entered the chat. He has informed us that Paran is in Mecca. No point Googling for answers. So, you know, if you if you look up information, you might find something mm -hmm. different, but don't bother doing that because he tells us that, that Paran is in Mecca. That, that's all there is to it. Okay. Um, and right. Moses and Aaron did pilgrimage at the Kaaba. And mm. his evidence for all this, I believe, is his imagination, but he can correct me if he has some sources to back yeah. this information. Exactly. Um, and the other thing we're going to talk about here is Paran, right? Paran is what Sassafras has decided is actually Mecca. And he has decided that it is Mecca because, well, um, it, it has to be. <laughs> Let's be honest. It, it has to be. And Muslims believe that uh, Mecca was established, of course, by uh, Adam, who came down on Earth. And that's, that's kind of the worship spot there. And then it uh, fell into ruins or something. And Abraham eventually came back, reestablished it, fell back into ruins nobody knew it existed um and then it became a pagan shrine and for thousands of years it was pagan but it was really set up by uh yahweh the mono monotheist uh and then 600 a.d like over 3,000 years later we have it re-established for the monotheist to continue doing what the pagans continue to do and walk around circle face this black stone in this location in Mecca. It's actually pretty, pretty, pretty sad, but we're going to, we're going to jump into where uh, they, they get the idea. They typically focus on Abraham. They focus on Ishmael and they focus on Hagar. So we're going to talk about if Hagar and Ishmael and Abraham ever if the Bible ever mentions that they traveled down to Mecca, 11,000 kilometers south of them, right? So here's, here's the passage that we're going to quote. Ishmael went and lived in Paran. Now, they believe, Muslims believe, that Muhammad is a descendant of Ishmael because they believe that Ishmael went to Paran in Mecca, my question here is, why would he go to Paran in Mecca out in the middle of nowhere? There is no biblical history. There is no Talmudic history. There is no hint whatsoever of surviving evidence that they ever traveled that far south for any reason whatsoever. The one thing that we didn't talk about is what is in between Israel and Mecca. Uh, Thaddeus, are you familiar with the geography or would you like me to cover it? Uh, I'll let you cover it. I, I did um, familiarize myself with, but I'll let you cover it because right. I am busy talking with Safran. All right, chain. beautiful. <laughs> I will let you keep doing that. I'll just go on. All right, pretty simple. It is barren, arid, desert, and not just desert. It is mountainous. It is there is hardly any water there. There's hardly any vegetation, and um, it's it's a mountainous and treacherous terrain to go past. So why on earth would people before airplanes and automobiles and such things travel down into the middle of the desert where they're probably going to die for 11,000 kilometers before they actually get there? Well, I can't see any reason for it and I can't see any hint for it in the Bible. But nonetheless, we will take a look and see what Genesis 21, 21 says about Ishmael and him living in Paran. It says he lived in the wilderness of Paran. His mother, which is Hagar, took a wife for him out of the land of Egypt. So let's go back here to the actual uh, ge real geography of this, right? So you see the wilderness of Paran. You see the, um, the Sinai Peninsula. So you see Israel and you see Cairo. You see those two things on your screen on the left. Hagar is an Egyptian. I want to repeat that for us. Hagar is an Egyptian. She was taken to Israel to be a servant to Abraham. And she bore Abraham a son, Ishmael, and they were kicked out of the household and they fled. Now, to be, to be honest with you, uh, Hagar tried to flee twice. She uh, fleed earlier. And do you know what direction she went? 
she went toward Egypt. Now, why would somebody who's from Egypt ever want to flee back to their hometown? It makes no sense whatsoever, except it actually does make sense. At the same time, when she, uh, wh where they were removed from the family of Abraham, they also went back towards Egypt. And the evidence of this is pretty clear that he lived in Paran, which as we see, the wilderness of Paran, you see it under your top left, that's right there next to Israel, in between Israel and Egypt on the northern part of the Sinai Peninsula. That's right in between. Why on earth would they travel 1,100, yeah, 1100 miles south into the middle of nowhere? And then once they're in the middle of the nowhere, they decide, you know what? Let me just go to Egypt and get a wife for my son. That's preposterous. There's no way that that would have ever happened. So we're going to jump into this a little bit more, but this is the route that Muslims imagine that Israel, the Israelites took with Moses out of the uh, out of Egypt and into the promised land, actually. But before we get that, we're going to talk about Abraham's journey. So on your left, you see the biblical passage about Abraham's journey. He goes around the Fertile Crescent, he goes to Egypt, and he comes back. However, <laughs> you see that the Muslim's imagination on the right-hand side is he makes the exact same journey, but they drew bigger red arrows that he decided to just go completely out of his way, out of the way of the Fertile Crescent, into a complete and desert uh, and mountainous terrain so that he could establish a black stone that people would turn into a pagan shrine. That's exactly what they think. Before you go on, uh, could you yeah. get back to that map? Yes, um, sir. I, I do have a question for you. Did you draw this Muslim map? Or did a Muslim actually draw this ridiculous? This map? was the best one I could find from a Muslim who has who has drawn it. This is uh, well, it's it, it has Ibrahim, peace be upon him, father of the prophets, and then I don't even know what Kalur Rahman uh, around eighteen hundred BC. Yeah, no, I did not. I just I found this. I found this on uh, Google Images, my friend. So I was just trying to find the best map. Because uh, when I when I looked at these slides before we got started, I thought that you had drawn this to mock the Muslim. <laughs> no, no, this is this is legit, man. Um, I'm not sure exactly. I'd have to go back and look, but I'm not sure exactly what Muslim website it was from. No, that, that's great that they they actually and they even put it in red. It's like mm -hmm. they they put the real path in uh, orange, and then they drew in their own. Path in right, red. right. <laughs> what it what it looks like to me is they literally just took the biblical passage right because it, it essentially looks like the one on the left um and they just zoomed out a little bit and drew their own red arrows <laughs> to yeah i i think it, that's map. probably what it is that they took someone else's map and they add mm -hmm. in the red arrows yeah and and what's what's cool about the map on the left and i know it's not incredibly clear but what's cool about the map on the left is you can see all of these names listed in the bible you can see them all listed in the bible we have a really 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 good idea 100 percent certainty in most of the areas and a, and a 90 plus percent certainty in most of the other areas exactly where these locations were that abraham traveled to like i said there's not a hint in the biblical passage, Talmudic passage, commentary passages, anything like that, that would, that would even lead anyone to believe that they traveled so far south out into the middle of a, an arid mountainous desert to a place for no reason at all. And then to even complicate it a little bit further than that, when is it ever mentioned again? If this is like the house that God built starting with Adam to Abraham, to all of like, where is this mentioned? It's not. And, and nobody would try to delete that out of their history. What motivation would they have to delete this out of their history prior to 
Muhammad, right? I, I can understand a conspiracy theorist saying, well, after Muhammad, they went back and they erased it because they didn't want to have an rape. No, this would have been someone that they were actually genuinely looking forward to. This would have been a very key focus. The temple, the tabernacle, all of those things in Jerusalem, mountains in Jerusalem, mountains in the Sinai Peninsula. These are all key factors and locations that uh, the Bible speaks about pretty frequently none of which do they ever talk about this black cube that pagans walk around it's just not it's just not a thing thaddeus i don't i don't comprehend how they get to there but they do so i can yeah. say with a very very high degree of certainty that abraham ishmael and hagar never went anywhere near mecca but we're gonna pause we're gonna pause here for a second and we're going to do a little Bible story time. The reason why we're going to do this Bible story time is because this is going to help outline what it is that Deuteronomy 33 verses 1 to 4 are talking about, right? So once upon a time, a Moses met God and God was like, take off your sandals. The place you're standing is holy ground, except for it was a burning bush with the angel of Yahweh in it. Yet it was Yahweh speaking, but it was the angel, except it was Yahweh. The angel of Yahweh is Yahweh, but not Yahweh. Look, the story only makes sense if God is plural in personhood, but nobody, nobody really believes that. Anyway, God wanted Moses to lead his people, the Israelites, out of slavery and into Egypt and back to the land he promised their forefather Abraham curmudgeon old pharaoh wasn't too keen on the idea of losing all of his slaves and so he was like that's a big no for me dog until god unleashed 10 plagues and devastated the land and pharaoh was finally like all right go and he even paid for their trip fee the israelites were super stoked and they head straight out and they rested by the red sea but pharaoh he straight up gangster he was like psych let me send my army to slaughter you. And God used Moses to part the sea and the Israelites were home free, sort of. During their time back, they kind of rebelled a little bit. Some crazy stuff went down. The 11 day journey took a little bit longer than anticipated by like uh, 40 years, but it wasn't all for naught because Moses met God face to face. Moses shone the glory of God for a spell. He received the Ten Commandments. He defeated his enemies and he made it rain. Manna, that is, which wasn't really Moses, but it was God. Speaking of God, God, well, actually, it was the angel of Yahweh, but it was Yahweh. I mean, the angel, well, maybe they're both God, led the Israelites with a cloud of smoke during the day and a pillar of fire at night. Sometimes God even went ahead of the camp and defeated Israel's enemies for them. And then Moses died. The end. Not incredibly the end, but this is relevant to the passage because God appeared as literal fire, right? Every single day. He brought laws to the Israelites and he defeated their enemies. So when we read the passage for today, we are going to get a summary of the events from Moses near the end of his life. And as you might imagine, someone near the end of their life, they're getting a little bit reflective, right? So before we go into the exegesis, we're going to put a couple of more things into perspective. So the reason why I put this screen up when I was telling you guys the Bible story is so you can see the most likely route that the Israelites took. They set up camp in a lot of different areas, and you will perfectly note that none of those areas, I know we don't believe in maps, but none of those areas indicate that they went straight south for no reason into the middle of nowhere for nothing except for a black rock that didn't actually exist, but that's a little bit besides the point. But this is what we can say from the biblical passage, from the interpretation of it, from all of the Talmudic, Mishratic texts, all of the Bible commentaries, none of them think that they just traveled south in the middle of nowhere for no reason. I can say emphatically with conviction that Moses never went to Mecca. So this is what the text says. Now, this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the Israelites before his death. Then he said, Yahweh came from Sinai, 
right? We know where that is now. He dawned upon them from Seir. We know where that is now. He shone on them from Mount Paran. We know where that is now. And he came with myramids of holy ones at his right hand, a fiery law for them. Moreover, he loves his people. All the holy ones were in your hand and they bowed down to your feet. Each one accepted directions from you. A law Moses instructed for us as a possession for the assembly of Jacob. Okay, so that's what the text says. I know I've, I've read it twice so far, but we're going to start to break it down a little bit. Uh, so Moses is, the, essentially what Moses is doing here is he is blessing the Israelites. So now this is what it says. Now this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the Israelites before his death. We, we understand the scene. They've already done the vast majority of the Exodus. Joshua is going to take them into the promised land. They are, they are far enough into or near the promised land they can see it from the top of the hill moses is the one who is delivering this message and the israelites are the ones who are hearing this message so moses is uh first thing it says is yahweh right came from sinai moses is reminding the israelites why what they have experienced during the the exodus uh Thaddeus, have you ever seen uh, like the black Hebrew as Israelites, how they uh, kind of read out Bible passages? Yeah, well, I, I've certainly um, seen it on Vocab's channel yep. or on, on David okay. Wood. I, I can't say that I've, you know, like gone directly to the original content. We but... are going to try this. <laughs> okay. I'm going <laughs> to. <laughs> oh, no, this is, this is not good. <laughs> you get to be the guy behind everybody that shouts. Okay. And you're going to shout on the Exodus route. You think you can do that? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yahweh came from Sinai. On the Exodus route. Yahweh dawned from Seir. On the Exodus route. Yahweh shone forth from Mount Paran. On the Exodus route. Beautiful. What does that mean? What are we trying to say? I'm sorry. I can't, I can't, <laughs> I can't keep it up. Right. So the, he's talking about the Exodus route. This is clearly, clearly the Exodus route. Past tense, by the way. All right, we're going to get into a little bit of deep, deep theology here. This is not something that is set in stone. I might have a strong opinion. Thaddeus might have a strong opinion. We might both have weak opinions, but it doesn't, at the end of the day, it doesn't necessarily matter about a few of these things, but we're going to go into what some of the biblical commentaries say about this passage. So Yahweh came with, right? So we know what Moses is telling them they came through the Exodus route. It's a recollection of the Exodus route, which would lead us to believe that the rest of this passage is also a recollection of things that have happened. And that's the key point. This is a recollection of things that have happened. Myriads of holy ones at his right hand, a fiery law for them. Who is them, Thaddeus? Looks like it's probably Israel. All right. You're not going to shout Israel. Oh, you want me to? Do, you want me to do the black king? I don't know. I don't know, it man. The nation of Israel, which All is right. the black people. Yes, exactly. And um, so you don't have to shout at this one. So the, the the question here with the exegesis of the passage is 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 the is them Israel right? We clearly know that Israel is them. Is them the same subject as the holy ones? Right. This is where we get into a little bit of gray area. Moreover, he loves his people. Who are his people? Israel. Huh. That's right. Yahweh Shah, all the all the holy ones, which might be Israel, were in your Yahweh's hands, and they Israel bowed down to your Yahweh's feet. Each one, which could be either Israel or the holy ones, depending how you want to understand this, accepted direction from you. The you spoken here is Yahweh, a law Moses instructed for us. He's Moses is including himself here, Israel. As a possession, which is the, the law, he instructed us in the law as a possession for the assembly of Jacob, who is Israel. All right, so we're going to break this down. Um, do you have anything you want to add to that, Thaddeus, before I start reading here? No, I, I think I'm good. You did a great job. Um, <laughs> I'm super motivated. You got me amped up. Hopefully, audience, you're amped up too, man. We're, we're feeling it. We're Kill feeling him. it. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, just ahead of myself. <laughs> All right. So this is what it says from the JFB Bible 
commentary. So the Lord came under a beautiful metaphor borrowed from the dawn and progressive splendor of the sun. The majesty of God is sublimely described as a divine light which appeared in Sinai and scattered its beams on all of the adjoining regions in, di in directing Israel's march to Canaan in these descriptions of a theophany. God is represented as coming from the south, and the allusion is in general to the thunderings and the lightnings of Sinai, but the other mountain, but other mountains in the same direction are mentioned with them. The location of Seir was on the east of Gior. Mount Paran was either in the chain on the west of Gior, or rather in the mountains of the southern border of the desert toward the peninsula. Right, uh, and we saw the pictures of these particular peninsulas so we're getting an idea of the direction we're getting an idea that this is of course god leading the israelites out from egypt and towards the promised land within this commentary we get a few different um, things that we can read to get a deeper and fuller understanding of this so judges 5 says lord when you set out from seir and marched across the fields of edom thaddeus is this on the exodus route Yes. Okay, it is. The earth trembled, the skies poured down rain, the mountains quaked at the presence of the Lord. Did this happen during the Exodus? It did. Especially what it says here, the God of Mount Sinai in the presence of the Lord, the God of Israel. All right, so this is Judges 5. This is reflecting back to it. They're also reflecting in the same way that Moses is reflecting, talking about a past historical event that Israel is familiar with. We get on to another one, which is Psalm uh, 68, 7, and 8. Oh God, when you led your people out of Egypt, when you marched through the dry wasteland, the earth trembled and the heavens poured down rain before you, the God of Sinai, before God, the God of Israel. Right, so this is kind of breaking down a little bit further into the commentary. We're going to get into one more commentary here before we take a little bit of a break. So this is the uh, Faithful Study Bible. This is what it says. It says, He shone forth from Paran, describing Yahweh's journey with the camp of Israel from Sinai to Canaan. Despite difficulties in the passage, it basically agrees with similar passages that described Yahweh's presence localized south of Canaan, somewhere in the upper Sinai Peninsula, such as the Seir, Edom, Teman, and Mount Paran. And keep in note, we're going to see Seir, Teman, and Mount Paran mentioned when we cover uh, Isaiah 42. This is a reflective, this is reflective language reminding Israel about all the things that Yahweh, their Lord, has done for them. These passages cast Yahweh as a divine warrior leading his heavenly army. You know how Muslims love, I'm just pausing here. You know how Muslims love Thaddeus to say that God, it says God is not a man. But how many times in the Bible say God is like a man of war? It says that a few times, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, we may have a passage later on that Muslims will go to that says that Yahweh went out like a mighty man of war and they'll just <laughs> delete the word Yahweh and say that Muhammad went out like a mighty man of war. Man, they don't, they don't give a shirk if it's shirk, man. It's uh can't believe it's not shirk. All right. So, uh, so Yahweh and his divine warriors leading his heavenly army, the myriads of holy one, right? So the Hebrew phrase, this is kind of what we were talking about earlier. This is where we can get a little bit deep in, into the theological reading of this. So the Hebrew phrase used here, Revath Kadesh seems to refer to the heavenly host, right? So when he says the myriads of holy ones, it could be talking about the heavenly hosts or it could also mean the myriads of Kadesh or the myriads or so Kodesh or Kadesh describing the large Israelite camp. So it could actually be talking about the Israelites themselves. So the holy ones could be a reference to angelic creatures or heavenly hosts, or it could actually be talking about the Israelites or a third option here is it could be a double entendre. It could be talking about both, which the Bible does this uh, somewhat frequently. It might also be a place name. Kadesh was situated in Paran near Seir Edom. Again, 
did I? Oh man, I forgot to scroll for it. I was reading, but anyway, that's that's what I read. You guys saw that. Um, so this is this is something that is is describing the direction and the location of these things. We're gonna go to our Kufar maps to talk about Kadesh. Where is Kadesh? Well, this is within the wilderness of Paran. This is within the area of what is traditionally believed to be Seir. This is on the Exodus route out of Sinai and towards Israel, the promised land. So we're seeing that this is, is more than likely talking about the Exodus route. It's used in past tense. So we're going to end up going into some summaries here. But all right, we're coming up on the summary here, folks. This has been this has been fun. I've I've had a lot of fun today. Thank you for uh, all the interaction and stuff, uh, especially in the comment section. That's been that's been pretty sweet. So here's here's the summary, and hopefully you guys came to this conclusion. I hopefully laid it out well enough that you would be able to to do so. Right. So Yahweh is the one who shone forth. It's Yahweh. It's not Muhammad. It says Yahweh. In the scripture but the muslims tell us that it is muhammad who shone forth this is shirk end of story if muslims want to believe that this is a, a prophecy of muhammad and that he was the one who shone forth go ahead you are you have made yourself an apostate you are guilty of the most heinous and unforgivable sin possible congratulations you are not that bright Moses is reminding the Israelites of the journey that they had up until this point. And Paran and Seir are at least a thousand kilometers north of Mecca. Any one of these points will end this as potentially being about Muhammad. Pick whichever one you think is the strongest and go with that. I'm leaning towards Shirk, but you can defeat the argument in multiple ways if you would like to. Again, repeating, these events are described and have taken place in the past. Hence, why it's you, they're, they're speaking with past tense words. We know that Moses never traveled to Mecca or anywhere near Mecca, and we know that Abraham never traveled anywhere near Mecca, and heck, we even know that Ishmael never traveled anywhere near Mecca. Pretty straightforward, guys. This passage is an epic failure for finding Muhammad written about in our scriptures. Last week's, you know, I think I think that's about the, one of their strongest arguments. Um, we'll see what comes up in these next few weeks. Maybe they'll have stronger arguments, but unless they want to continually deify Muhammad by mistake or ignorance thus forcing themselves to commit shirk, I really highly suggest Muslims that you stay away from this particular passage.